HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.com, bringing you the freshest radio in Brooklyn since 2009. Hear directly from chefs to farmers, artists to architects, authors to brewers, and everyone in between. Check out all of our shows on our website or by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes store. On behalf of everybody at HeritageRadioNetwork.com, we'd like to send a special thank you to the Hearst Ranch, our biggest supporter and longest-running sponsor since we first started in 2009. Hearst Ranch is the nation's largest single-source supplier of free-range, all-natural, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef. Since 1865, the Hearst family has raised cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of the Central California coast. The result is beef with extraordinary flavor that's as memorable and natural as the surrounding landscape. For more information, visit www.hearstranch.com. It's Thursday at 1 o'clock, and you are tuned into the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report, coming to you live from the back of Roberta's in a steamy Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we are on the line today with Monica Warwick, who's going to talk some meat with us. Monica, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for coming on. I'm just curious. It's supposed to feel like 105 degrees in Brooklyn today. What's the weather like down where you are? It's the same. It's so hot out here. <laughs> Steamy. Well, I well, know. It's good. I guess like spend some time inside talking about American Meat, uh, the documentary that you are working with. So why don't we start, um, I guess, at the beginning. Uh, what, what's up with American Meat? What's the story? So American Meat um, is a featured documentary about a grassroots revolution going on right now uh, in sustainable farming. So we feature Joel Saladin, which I'm sure um, a bunch of you out there know about, and it's Polyface Farm down in Swoop, Virginia. And basically the movie is just to tell the story about um, sort of conventional farmers and how the system is working out right now um, as far as, you know, commodity farmers and how they use, you know, more like confinement barns. And then we sort of juxtapose that with uh, what, is sort of the food revolution right now in sustainable farming and um, how, you know, we can change our agricultural processes to actually be more efficient and healthier. So um, we just tell the story of of both farmers and sort of the direction that we're moving in right now. So I was curious. I know that your film, you know, follows uh, several different farmers. You know, Joel, I think, has received a lot of press over the last few years, you know, deservedly so for the kind of grass-based system that he runs down at Polyface. But what I thought was most interesting about the documentary is that you guys are also looking at um, conventional farmers and their practices, but not through some kind of covert, undercover, hidden camera, but actually going in and working with the farmers and, um, you know, trying to create some transparency around their operations and maybe I think something that's really been missing from this conversation, which is a kind of frank look at, at you know, what really is involved in that type of meat production. How does, 
how, how do we get there? And also that, you know, these farmers uh, definitely don't deserve to be, you know, in large part, don't deserve to be kind of demonized or looked at as the enemy, but as potential allies and kind of stewards of, of a lot of land and a lot of information. I'm curious, how did you guys gain access to the farmers that you worked with? How did those relationships come about? Well, you know, I, um, I'm i glad that you brought this up because it's a really, I think it is really an interesting part about the movie. And um, conventional farmers get kind of a bad rep. And our whole idea was just, you know, let's go in and talk to them as people, get to know them, and just sit down with them, interview them. And, um, you know, they really were able to open up with us. And, you know, they're, they're really just, they're people just like you and me, and they love to farm and you know, they kind of got caught in a system where everybody was moving towards conventional farming using confinement barns. And, you know, they're, they're really, we see them more as like, um, almost like a victim in the system. You know, they're, they have to raise more, you know, say, for example, the hog farmers. They have to raise more hogs to make the same amount of money. The only way to do that, uh, you know, was kind of to use the confinement barn. And, you know, they... They're just trying to make a living and support their family, um, you know, just like everybody else. And they're they're willing to go organic. Um, it's just a matter of of sort of showing them you know, that path. I guess yeah, they're talking people, about that path. People want it, and the more the more the demand for it, the more they're willing to do it. You know, they're not against it. They would love to do it because it would actually work out better for them from a financial standpoint. They would um, actually receive more money from doing organic farming than the way it's done right now. And um, right now, the conventional farmer only gets about eight cents for each dollar spent because the parent company ends up keeping the rest. So, you know, they have to take out loans for the technology, and you know, they're they're really kind of stuck right now and they would love to, to work more with you know the grass based farming system and the techniques and um, it's just right now the demand for it that, that we're kind of waiting on here. So the the farmers that you interviewed you 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 talked to several people in different parts of the country I mean how, how did those first contacts happen where were you do you know did you get a list of Smithfield farmers or uh, Tyson farmers and go down the list or I mean how did you pick the people that you chose to feature um, well a lot of a lot of the the conventional farmers we talked to were in Iowa and we kind of figured out that that was um, you know a major like centralized location where a lot of the conventional farmers were especially hog farmers so um, we kind of figured that out first, and then we just kind of poked around and found people who were willing to to sit down with us and tell their story. And um, from there, the rest of the farmers we talk about are the ones who are sort of using Joel Saladin's methods with grass-based farming. And, you know, a lot of them actually first heard about Joel Saladin and were like, you know, I could do this too. So, um, you know, that's how we got those contacts kind of from him and they, they're those farmers are all over the people who are now mimicking Joel South methods I mean they're they're the in the Northeast they're in the Midwest they're everywhere so it's really inspirational so how do you think that that this film kind of fits into you know there has been the release of several different food-based um, kind of documentary style or documentary films over the last few years you know thinking about um, King Corn and, uh, you know, other films like that. Where does American Meat kind of fit in that kind of pantheon uh, of information? And what role do you guys see that uh, this film serving that differentiates it from some of the other stories that are being told right now? Right. Um, Well, I think the other movies that have come out have been more uh, geared towards the public and sort of exposing how our system is like, our current system, with conventional farming. And it was a lot of, um, you know, when people watched it, it was, it was shocking. And, you know, the methods that were used, those were things people have never seen before. And so it was kind of, I think those movies were more exposing what's going on. American Meat differs in that it's more solution-oriented and it's more geared towards... Um, telling the farmer's story and and kind of telling other farmers out there what they can do to uh, sort of start going towards grass-based uh, sustainable agriculture. 
So um, it's definitely more solution oriented, and there's there's also a section um, for you know everyday people as well on on what they can do as far as you know buying their food locally, going to farmers markets, stuff like that. But um, it's it's really geared towards the farmers. That's great. I mean, I I I know that like one of the things I'm often struck by speaking with people who are who are working within the conventional egg system is that. There is a lot of history there, and if you're in an environment where um, the education system through the land, you know, the land grant based institutions and the community that you're surrounded with and the people who sign essentially your paycheck are all kind of driving you in one area, it's you're working from you're coming at these issues from a very different mindset than uh, I think more urban based professionals or consumers who, who don't kind of understand the ins and outs of the choices that that the uh, farmer is being faced with in in the U.S. in particular, and um, I think it's it's great to kind of start this conversation. And I think it, one of the things that uh, you we we as kind of interested consumers who want to you know make a push for things in a different direction need to be careful about is how ha- you know having conversations kind of with food producers, not. At, at food producers and did you find when you were speaking um with with different farmers on, on either side of the conventional or, or the grass-based method i mean how receptive were they to some of the to some of the stuff that you have been um kind of sharing through you know joel's system or in general kind of steps that people can take towards more sustainable uh meat practices Right. Um, Yeah, well, I mean, I know I'll give you one example. Um, Chuck Wirtz is a farmer that we featured. Uh, He's a a hog farmer, and he's based out of Iowa. And, um, you know, we talked about him at the beginning of the film, and then then at the end of the film when we're talking about um, sort of the sustainable agriculture, we bring him back again. And he talks about how him and a group of farmers down there set up this whole organic system um, to try and be U- uh, USDA certified and to try and, you know, gear towards more sustainable methods. And he said that he couldn't get um, a buyer to buy the organic products. And, you know, he said he, he was willing to do it and he was exciting and they put the work into it uh, because originally they were promised to have a buyer. Um, but then that fell through. But basically the point is that they're, they're open to these methods, and they're willing. And like I said before, it's, it's actually better financially for them to do it this way. And not only that, but it creates more jobs, more people are needed for uh, grass-based farming. And um, it's, it's really community-oriented. It gets the whole family involved. And they're, they're not, they're not shutting, shutting it down at all. And I think that's something that we're really trying to show in this, in this film is... Um, you know they're they're open to it, and they just it's a matter of the demand can do they have people who want to buy the organic meat and that's that's the issue right now, you know, and that's where it comes down to the people so yeah, you're creating that marketplace. I know that obviously the heritage radio network was was started as a project through heritage foods u s a which is an organization that essentially exists to create a marketplace for farmers looking to um grow products that don't kind of fit right now into a more conventional model. And and the big focus at Heritage is, is on breeds and looking at breed preservation and biodiversity in the food supply. Does that work into the film at all, kind of looking at not only the, the growing practices, but also the genetics of the animals? Um, yeah, I, it definitely plays into uh, the grass-based farming technique and, you know, kind of the conventional farming technique right now is to just have one one animal, you know, it's either a hog farm or you're, it's, a, it's a cattle or it's chickens, you know, and what the grass base does is it, I'll, I'll use a quote kind of from Joel Saladin, is that it provides the habitat uh, to fully express the ecological distinctiveness of the animals, meaning that, you know, every animal kind of has their own way of, of surviving and um it all kind of connects and, and builds on each other. So Joel Salatin's idea is to use that to his advantage. Um, you know, the cows come in on the field. You know, they um, have the manure droppings. Afterwards, he brings the chickens in on top of them, and he'll and the chickens will then pick out the, the crickets and the bugs 
um, out of the manure, which is something that they would naturally do in the environment, you know. So um, everything sort of builds off of each other, and it results in a much healthier and more efficient way of farming. Um, and it's a great way to, a uh, great use of the land. You can use less land. And um, so it, it really is more far, farms should have multiple animals on them. You know, they shouldn't just have one animal. And so that's, I think that definitely plays a big part in this film as well. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think one of my favorite, you know, thoughts from Joel is always, you know, he considers himself not, you know, a meat grower, but a, but a grass farmer. And if you take good care of the grass, the grass will take good care of you. Um, we're going to take exactly. a, a quick break in a second here. But um, before we do, if people want to learn more about the film, is there a website or are you on Facebook? Is there anything we can direct them to yeah, during the break? Yeah, I would recommend um, going on our Facebook. It's just uh, www.facebook.com slash American Meat. Um, we have a website right now that is in the works. It is almost ready, but uh, I would recommend going on Facebook for more information and Twitter as well. Awesome. So we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about American meat. Okay. Following is a public service announcement from Heritage Radio Network. Tune in to Hot Grease every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Hot Grease strives to bring sustainability, localized sourcing, and other forward-thinking schools of culinary thought to the minds and kitchens of everyday folk. Each week, Nicole Taylor's conversations cover the entire spectrum of food enthusiasts, from internationally renowned culinary masters to moms on a budget looking to impress their tiniest critics. Again, that's every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Hot Grease on the Heritage Radio Network. Okay, we are back. You are tuned into the Farm Report, coming to you live from the back of Roberta's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. We are on the line with Monica Warwick, who is the Outreach Coordinator for American Meat. Uh, American Meat is a feature documentary about a grassroots revolution in sustainable farming starring Joe Salatin and his Polyface Farm in Swoop, Virginia. So you guys just recently uh, had your premiere, correct, down in Virginia? Yep, exactly. And how did that go? It was extremely successful, and we are so happy coming out of that weekend. Um, And let me just say that the network of you know, sustain, people who are interested in sustainable agriculture, the organizations of farms around the entire country is just, I mean, it's a true inspiration to how many people came out and supported this film. And um, Joel Saladin also had field day at his farm that weekend. So, you know, there were over 2,500 uh, farmers who came. So um, that was great. And we had um, events along with the, the screenings. We had Chipotle, um, they donated burritos to the audience members, and um, because the CEO of Chipotle, Steve Ells, is uh, also featured in our film, so that was very exciting, and um, our screenings are really, we want them to be a community event, you know, a farming is a, a community thing, you know, that a family's involved, um, and we just want to get our message out there, we want people to eat good food, eat locally produced food, and just have discussions about what's going on. Um, So it was a really great weekend, and and we're so excited, and we're heading to Iowa next. Yeah, so I see that you have a series of screenings located in Iowa, and then are there plans for a a more um, national kind of screenings, or if people from the Brooklyn area are interested in in seeing the film, what can they do aside from, you know, getting on a plane and heading out to, to, to Iowa? 
Yeah, um, as of right now, we are just going around nationally, kind of state to state, um, setting up screenings uh, with our whole team here. And then in February, we're going to have um, licenses available. So people who are interested will be able to purchase a license, and they'll get, um, you know, a press kit, uh, and they can kind of create their own event around the film. And um, you can see it that way. And then it'll start to come out on DVD around February as well. And probably within a year, or in a year, it'll be, you can download it through, it'll be on Hulu, Netflix, iTunes, um, etc. So it's awesome. a process, but as of right now, we're setting up screenings one by one, and eventually uh, it will be out on TBD and everybody will be able to get it. Can you tell me a little bit more about the team? I know, so it looks like the, the film is a project through an organization called Leave It Better, is that correct? Yeah, um, I can tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the director of the film, um, Graham Merriweather, he um, he created Leave It Better, which is a nonprofit, uh, the solution-based environmental organization um, based out of New York City, and um, it's a great organization. We have programs um, in, in the schools here, and it's just really we're trying to educate about sustainable agriculture. Awesome. One of the things that I feel like that comes up a lot in in these conversations and a question that I've kind of personally been interested in exploring a little bit more is, you know, often what is thrown back at people in the sustainable food movement or, or those interested in moving towards organics in general is this elitist argument that that we're creating a food supply that that people can't afford. And I'm wondering, does the film address this question at all from a consumer perspective or do you personally kind of have any any response to that charge? Yeah, the film definitely um, talks about this a little bit, and um, I'll kind of give you my own spiel as well. But um, basically right now in our current system, the government is, is totally subsidizing it. So um, that means that they're you know, putting money into the system, which drives down the prices of the food. So in reality, if the government didn't subsidize the conventional farming, food prices would be a lot higher than they really are. So we're kind of living in this, like, you know... Kind of false sequel, economy. So to say, so to speak, yeah. And, um, you know, there's, there's no subsidies for grass-based farms right now, no subsidies for the small farmer, you know, the family farms. It's all really geared towards these corporations. So, um, and I think, you know, right now, since the demand is relatively low for um, organic and sustainable agriculture... That's the reason the prices are so high. And, um, you know, there's a few things that could happen. You know, hopefully one day down the road the government maybe could change their subsidies and, you know, that would be a, a great solution. But as of right now, I think we're kind of working from the bottom up here. You know, we're coming from the people. The people have to start to, to do this movement here, and they have to be the ones to demand demand the organic food. And, you know, every time you walk into a grocery store, um, you're voting, really, for or how you want our system to be. And I think people don't realize how expensive food really is and what goes into producing it. We're kind of separated from the system. All we do is go to a grocery store, and it's all right there, you know. So um, eventually, with, with support, those prices will definitely go down, um, and hopefully with government support as well. But Awesome. I know that here in, in Brooklyn, we uh, and at Heritage Radio, we're really excited. Um, there's going to be a premiere on July 24th of the Greenhorns new film um, at the Bell House in, in Brooklyn from 7 to 9 p.m. And Severin, who runs the Greenhorns, has really become a, a, a spokesperson for this movement of young farmers. And I know um, Joel also has become a spokesperson in this movement uh, regarding, you know, sustainable farming and grass farming. I'm wondering, you know, who else has jumped out at you guys? Like, who are some other leaders in this movement that I, you know, our audience members should be keeping tracks on? Is there any kind of up and comers that we should be like, man, this dude in Iowa or someone in Colorado that we might not normally, you know, have access to? Um. We, uh, when you watch our film, we have we feature a bunch of farmers, and you know what? A lot of them are young. They're they're young farmers who said, you know, I can do this too, and they sort of are catching on to the movie here, which is, you know, which is absolutely wonderful because it's got to start from the younger generation. And um, 
I mean, we have, we, we feature a bunch of farmers. Um, one I know off the top of my head, his name is Matt Gallagher. Um, he's in uh, Sandusfield, Massachusetts, and he's uh, a young grass-based farmer who's mimicking Joel Salatin's techniques. Um, you know, he's definitely up and coming, and it's good because that's in Massachusetts, you know. It's, it's nearby, it's around the area. Um, we also have in New York, um, some, uh, it's called Slow Barn Center, and what's really great about them is they're educating new farmers on sustainable methods. So they're giving them the tools to really go out and do it themselves, and um, that's, you know, nearby Brooklyn, right by right New York. So that's really exciting as well, and, um, you know, I think they're going to, you know, play a huge part in this movement. Yeah, age is a big thing that people talk about with regards to farming. I mean, there there's a lot of conversations around the fact that, like, you know, America's farmers are kind of a dying breed and the average age of farmers in the U.S. being something in the early 60s. Did you find that was a big contrast between people doing conventional and, and sustainable farming where, you know, on one side people were young and on the other side people were, were older or was it more of a mixed bag? No, you're you're definitely right about that. Um, and there's a there's a lot less young farmers out there, and and a big reason for that is the conventional farming method. Um, it really doesn't need as many hands as it as it used to need. Uh, we have the technology now, and that does it for us. You know, you have a huge um, you have a huge barn for you know hundreds of pigs, and you don't really need. You know, you need one person, two people to manage that. It's not the same. Every, every, everything's confined. Um, grass-based farming, however, you need a lot more people to, to run the operation. And, um, you know, what's great about that is, is we would need about 4 million people to feed the USA um, with grass-based farming. So, uh, number one, that would mean more jobs for people, which, you know, right now would be a great thing considering our economy is still still kind of recovering and um also it just gets the young generations involved because right now there's almost you know not a need for them kids you know the kids who are growing up in these farms feel like they should you know really go out and do something else even though maybe they would like to farm so grass-based farming definitely utilizes more hands and that's a major reason um you know, the technology and the conventional farming methods now is a major reason that we don't see as many young farmers yeah, I think the the kind of age conundrum is, is interesting on a couple of levels, and in particular when we're thinking about media. And, and you know, obviously, um, you guys have decided to tell your story through film. And, you know, we talked a little bit earlier in the show about, you know, Facebook and Twitter and these other kind of social media tools for getting the word, the word out. I mean, why, why film? I mean, it, is there something in particular about this medium as, as a storytelling device that, that makes it kind of a... Uh, a better choice uh, for for creating change at a grassroots level, or is the is the film kind of in collaboration with other projects? I mean, I just was able to kind of briefly look at the Leave It Leave It Better site, but it seems like they do a number of video projects through that organization. So, is there a particular history with film there, or just an interest, or, or you know, why movies, why why documentaries? Um, well, I think uh, well, first off. Graham Merriweather, who, you know, founded Leave It Better and was the director of the film, um, you know, is a filmmaker himself. So for him, um, video really sort of tells the story, um, and that's kind of his way of, of getting it out there. And I think also, I would say for me personally, when you visually see what's going on in our food system, um, that's... It, it does come to a shock uh, to a lot of people. And you kind of, like I said before, we're separated from the method today. And we don't really know exactly what's going on, nor do we really think about it as much as we, we should be. And um, and I think video is, is a great way to, to really show people what's going on. And especially in American meat, um, you know, you see the conventional farming, we're in there, you see the animals, you see how it works, and then all of a sudden, you know, later in the movie, we start talking about grass-based farming, and we're on Joel Saladin's farm, and you see all the animals are outside, you know, they're running around, they're doing what they, they should be doing, and the juxtaposition of that is just, 
in your head, you just know. You see the animals. They look happier. They look healthier. And it, it looks like they're living a the life they're supposed to be living. And I think that's something that um, speaks very strongly to people. Yeah, I think on some level you're, you're lifting the veil. So thank you so much for coming on today, Monica. And, you know, check out American Meat at Facebook. Uh, if you're on the Heritage Radio Network site right now, click on our Facebook or Twitter links to hook up with them. And tune in next week. Uh, we're super excited to host Scott Stringer, the Manhattan Borough President, who will be on talking about his one of their most recent reports, Red Tape, Green Vegetables, uh, looking at community-based farming and how to increase access to that land and those markets in New York City. Tune in next week, 1 o'clock, on The Farm Report. This is Behind the Scenes Food News with Katie Kiefer. Removing barriers to better quality locally raised meats is one step further along the process. The Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, or NMPAN, is connecting people across the country with information, tools, and each other. The organization is part of the Cooperative Extension Systems Extension, an internet-based collaborative learning service that consolidates the resources of the land-grant universities. The NMPAM affiliates are now available in almost 40 states and allow the co-coordinators to link people who need help with those who can offer it, such as extension staff members, state departments of agriculture, and markets with experience in small meat processing. They offer webinars, business plans, and hands-on help for processors or wannabe processors. More information is offered at their website, www.nichemeatprocessing.org. This has been Behind the Scenes Food News with Katie Kiefer. Bushwick Block Party. Block Party. Block it's a party in the street. Free pizza by Roberta. Death Killer Death Wrestling. Featuring the legendary Mad Dog Tosto. Photo booth by Ryan Slack. Waterworld. Closed by Chimera Dactyl. Mary Meyer. Warren Bogart. Death Killer Asphalt Resistant Jeans. All types of food for your face. Sweet Soda by p Roberta's Bake Sale. Heritage Food USA. Orangini Eating Contest by the Orangini Brothers. Live music by Alex Trujan. Florida Paper Twin. Gang Sign. The Netherlands. Team Robespierre. Wild Yak. MC Todd and Bo Breezy. Night Show. Yeah, yeah. Sponsored by Martin Greenfield Clothers. Free Fitness Studio. Heritage Radio Network. Free Williamsburg. Six Point Beer. Momo Sushi Shack. Beer Box USA. Planet of the Bates. Bushwick Block Party. It's a party in the street. All day long. Finger on the Pole and City Winery are proud to present the Summer Barbecue Blowout Festival, August 6th, from noon to 4 p.m. The barbecue is happening at City Winery, located at 155 Varick Street in New York City. Restaurants featured at this event are Empire Mayonnaise, Van Dag, Momofuku Mopar, Imperial No. 9, Mile End, Mexicu, Kraft, Dizzy's Club, Coca-Cola, The Meatball Shop, and Dos Toros. Providing the soundtrack for the day are Midnight Magic, Pewter Magic, New Villager, Punches, Ducky, DJ Autobot, and the Snacky Tune DJ. VIP and general admission tickets are available at citywinery.com. Finger on the pole for City Winery would like to thank our sponsors. Heritage Foods USA, New York Magazine, Rekha Vodka, Sonar, Smile, Guilt City, Sub-Zero and Wolf. Please come out and join us for a day of fun, food, and dancing. For more information, go to www.fotpnyc.com.